boundaries, and not one word about this has been uttered in the national parliament. But I think what what was demonstrated here by Kerry and, and Tony and that team and David was that when the people are given a voice, they're really capable of articulating very strongly and powerfully and persuasively their position. Um, I was reminded by David, uh, Professor Flint, about that powerful demonstration opposing the removal of the governor from Government House. Now, you know, to think that you've got this wonderful historic building there, which is just decaying, and we all know you live in a house, you can maintain its upkeep, you close the house down, whether it's a beach home or something, and the thing suddenly becomes useless and very difficult and costly to maintain, and for some, whatever, for what reason? So that poor Murray Bashir has to run home and sort of change her clothes for herself and get another set of clothes and get nicker feed. We, I mean, we don't expect, we don't expect our governor general, our, our governor, our governor general to live in that way. Certainly, the incumbent governor general wouldn't accept that. So, I hope, I hope Barry O'Farrell will will redress that piece of stupidity when he returns. The, John Howard also made these points, and they're valid points, about the, you know, the, the elite, the role of the elite, this notion that we know better than you. And that's what we were constantly told. Well, I know that's what you said, but you don't understand. Yes, I do understand. I'm very capable of understanding. I, what you mean to say is that I don't agree. And we will... There's a difference between not understanding and not agreeing. But we, there's an element of this still in contemporary society that if you don't agree with certain propositions, then it's simply because you're pig ignorant and you don't understand or you're a dyed-in-the-wool conservative and there's nothing worthwhile conserving. And we tend to forget what this means. I mean, John Howard wasn't a conservative. He was a radical conservative. He was radical enough to change the things that needed to be changed and taking a massive tax restructure to the electorate. That was a radical thing to do. But conservative enough to say there are things that we also must conserve that is, preserve, and we'll fight tenaciously to do that. And it was always that courage above all else, your willingness, as in this case, to stand against the rising tide, and you were never intimidated. <laughs> all sorts of things have happened since then, of course, because the support for the ACM translated into a wider understanding amongst the electorate of the good work that they were doing, that it wasn't work of self-interest. It was work of genuine community concern about how the proper government of this country could be best achieved. As John Howard has said, that doesn't mean to say every system's perfect. But of the systems available, 73% of the Australian electorate said this is by far the best option that we are being presented with. We're not stupid. We do understand. We enjoy the safety of the processes that are at work here. We do understand the structure. It seems to have served us well. We're the envy of the world. We don't feel uncomfortable when we go around the world saying, I'm an Australian, by the way, and we're, we're not a republic. Is that OK? <laughs> <laughs> Will you serve me? Please serve me. I am an Australian, but I mean, the Queen is still our head of state. I mean, this is, it's a non infantile argument that we wake up in the morning and we feel uncomfortable about the fact we don't have a president. Now, if there are people who are so disposed to that kind of thinking, there are plenty of republics around the world I can recommend to them. <laughs> so. All sorts of initiatives have been taken since then, and I don't want to canvas those here uh, today because I, you're dying for a bit of a feed. But, I, but I, I do want to say, make just one final point, and, and that is this, that I continue to be, from where I sit um, each day, I, I continue to be bothered, I think is the word I'd use, disturbed, by the energy that is consumed, and the rancour that is directed to people simply because they hold firmly to a particular view which is not consistent with the commentariat. And therefore, for that, 
you pay a high price. So you're, you're vilified and you're attacked, and it comes with this notion of freedom of speech. You're, you're really free to speak, but only if you say what we agree with. And there is a very pronounced element of that in relation to this movement. In other words, you must be treated with a degree of suspicion if you're still such a dinosaur that you support the constitutional monarchy. Now, that's okay for people like John Howard and for me and whatever, we've been built it up a hundred times and you stand your ground. But it does have the potential to intimidate people. And, and what we have to say, and therefore they don't put their heads up, they won't speak because they don't want to be, have these brickbats delivered towards them. And what we have to say to people is, we don't need to be intimidated. You don't have to apologise for your viewpoint on anything, let alone on this. You're as much entitled to your view as anybody else. When I get people on the open line, they say, oh, you know, da, da, they go on, and I say, well, away you go. Here we are, it's an open line. I've invited you to ring. I'm not going to shut you off. Speak. Well, of course, they wrap it on like this, and I stop. Are you there? Is there anything else you'd like to say? Oh, no, no, because when you ask people if they've got something to say, it's then that you realise they don't have much to say at all. Um, so, but at the same time, you know, he's as entitled to his view, his view as I am, and as, as John said before, it's so right, you then go to the ultimate jury, and that's the jury of the nation. It'll determine at the end of the day, and we saw a bit of that only this week, albeit a poll, but the public do change their mind. They do listen to argument. They do understand argument. And it's not necessary for that to be discussed with this kind of or rancor. I mean, you know, we have a system, I think the former Prime Minister said this, we have a system which is working. We have a system which is the envy of the world. We have a system which has, has delivered to Australia unprecedented benefits. Now, OK, I can understand someone having, as John said, a different viewpoint, but why do these people who are so ideologically driven and they seem to be issue-seeking, they seem to be sleep-inducingly irrelevant on so many occasions, but they constantly are trying to tamper with the structure that has worked so well? Now, there's other avenues where they could dedicate their energy, I would have thought. But if you were going through the scheme of things in Australia, what works and what doesn't work, you'd be hard pushed to say that our system of government doesn't work. You'd put a tick beside it and you'd leave it alone. Now, that doesn't mean to say we've got the feet in the mud and we're stuck there forever. We are radically conservative. We are radical enough to embrace things that need to be done and perhaps aren't being done, but conservative enough to say these things we must conserve and this notion that, look, we're only tampering a minor, minor way and it will be better. Well, the onus is on them to prove that it will be better and to this point they haven't. And ten years on, the case is no stronger for change than it was ten years ago. And this Prime Minister, this Prime Minister gave them every opportunity to have every nuance of their views understood, disseminated and debated. You gave them every chance. There was no way in the world anything they wanted to present to the electorate could be denied to the electorate. And in all of that, they got a fantastic result. They got 37% of the vote. 37% of the vote. 73% of the electorate. I mean, these things have got to be rammed home. And to those who say there's no mandate, I'm sorry. You underestimate the fact that the public are not always of the same view as the quote-unquote intelligentsia or the quote-unquote elites who want to have this view forced down your throat. They don't always represent what the people are about. And so I suppose in thanking you, uh, John Howard, I want to say that you were one man who wasn't prepared to stand by and watch a very successful structure, mechanism and process be dismantled. And that must have been difficult in the party room. It must have been difficult in the cabinet because you had to, with all this opposition, draft up the mechanism to put this to the public, to be fair to both sides, to be fair to those of divergent viewpoints. And you did it. And you were being told from time to time on this issue and on many others. Why don't you sort of listen, Prime Minister, the tide is rising against you. And often, there were occasions in the past when, yes, the water was up around your neck. But you still knew that the fight was worth the having. And through that, through you, we are here today, an infinitely better country. Not so, just on this issue, and I'm delighted I've got this opportunity to just move a vote of thanks, to thank you for a lot of things, you and your wife as well.
And I don't much mind how much of what I said is reproduced. These are sentiments that are genuinely and sincerely felt by many, many Australians on a range of fronts. Yeah. On a range of fronts, you've confronted the rising tide and you've turned it back. This is but one area where you were very, a very significant player in that result. So I don't think the circumstances have much changed in 10 years. I'd simply say to all of those people who think that we can sit around and hide in the back room and reproduce the argument, the argument of 10 years ago is true today. If you don't know, say no. And JH, Thank you so much.